Hangout on Air is live, apparently. Um, let's see. Yep. Yeah, we're all good. Yep. Yeah, cool. Okay, we're on next. So um, now we need to pretend like there's other people here so we don't seem like we're talking to ourselves. Um, no, I guess let me start by welcoming everyone. We're going to get started in about five minutes. Um, if you, what would be cool actually in the chat box is if you just want to say that you're here, tell us who you are. Nick and I will probably either one of us will know you, will know you or both of us will know you. Um, so it'd be good for us just to know who else is, is with us tonight. The plan is once we get started, just to have a really informal q and I don't think either of us have anything to share other than just to introduce who we are and a bit about our own HMO experience. Um, it's all going to be driven by you and the content that you want to share. Um, I guess it would also be good if you're saying hello just to tell us if you can hear us and if you can see us and if it's okay, the quality and everything like that. There's probably not much we can do anyway, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try. Um, so yeah, it's all going to be driven by the questions that you've got. Um, so feel free to start firing questions away. We also, um, as you probably know from the podcast, I'm a massive Gary V fan. Um, we might try and do a call in or we're going to try and do a call in as well. So we can get people to go into a bit more detail about, you know, problems that you're facing, deals that you're looking at, whatever that might be. And we can have a bit of a two way conversation rather than Nick and I just being talking heads for the next hour, hour and a half, however long the questions last. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll start properly. We'll give it a couple of minutes before we start and introduce ourselves. Um, and yeah, we'll get started just after seven o'clock, give everyone a chance to get into the room. Um, I've just been past the note. I've got my glamorous assistant helping out this evening. Victoria's going to be feeding the questions to Nick and I. Um, so yeah, just like I say, use the chat box and we will... It looks like people are chatting away. Actually, you know what? I wasn't going to open it, but I think I will do just so I can see it as well. Um, but it looks like we have oh, Terry's in the call. Um, Danny, Amar, Daniel, Oksana. Welcome, guys. Thank you for taking your time out of this lovely sunny evening to be with us. So there's 21 people watching. Apparently there's 21 people watching us, Nick. That's like, that's like celebrity status. Are you going to say anything or are you just going to sit there quietly all night? Yeah, you. This is everyone's, everyone's, you're the main event. You're here, whatever, you're why everyone is here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we've got the first question. Yeah. We'll give it a couple of Victoria saying we've got the first question already, but let's, um, let's give it a couple of minutes before we get started. Who is this skincare company? Oh, it's Amar. I thought I had. <laughs> I'm just reading the comments, Nick, and I've got someone called the skincare company IPL Laser Permanent Hair Removal. And I was like, God, the spammers are here already. But no, it's Amar. Loud and proud, as he said. Nice to see you, Amar. Sorry. Sorry for thinking immediately you were spam. But um, they're saying they can't really hear you, Nick. I don't know if you can maybe get closer to the microphone. I can hear Nick, so it might just be a volume thing. Yeah, I can still hear you. Just, um, Nick, maybe say a couple of sentences tell us how floyd's getting on and then if everyone can hear about floyd they can let us know that they can hear you okay nice <laughs> awesome No one else can hear you, Nick. I don't know why that is. Um, why would that be? Why would that be? Actually, I've got an idea. Hold on. Um, Do you need to make him presenter? Uh, testing, testing. Try, yeah, try saying something again, Nick, and we'll see how you get on. Um, so we just came in and dressed it basically, built pictures on the walls, made the beds, uh, 
Yes. So yeah, social media good help. Perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a bit quite tired. It's quiet. Actually. It's quite it's quite quiet. Quite eight a.m. So uh, can anyone hear me now? Or yeah, it yeah. sounds like sounds like they can hear you, although you're quite quiet. Um, I've just turned up the volume a little bit, um, so we'll see if that helps at all. But yeah, yeah, they're saying people are saying that they can hear you. If uh, oh yeah, okay, Amar's telling me it's much better now. So I changed the uh, microphone on the on the settings, so it should be it should be better now. Okay, perfect. Well, Amar said it is much better. Um, yeah, let's just give it a couple more minutes. But and on the topic of Floyd and kind of partially just to keep testing without saying testing constantly, Nick was just telling me about his canoe trip in July that um, he said, and he's trying to persuade me and Victoria to go along on it as well, which actually sounds pretty cool. But you're taking Floyd on a Canadian canoe. I'm amazed. I like, I, yeah, I will. It's almost worth going just to see that happen. Yeah, as long as he's got a life jacket on, so I'd have to buy him a special dog life jacket. Um, but other than that, it should be okay. Whether he will like it or not is a different matter. I don't actually know that or not. So I'm kind of contemplating whether I'm going to actually take him. Yeah, he might get him, he might just freak out. <laughs> um, so I don't know what's going to happen. So uh, I'm, I'm going to see if I can maybe test it. I mean, it's quite funny. He won't even get in it. I've got him a dog house, and he won't go inside the dog house. Um, <laughs> scared of it like so I've got food in there and I put his blanket in there but he won't he won't go in. So I'm trying I'm trying to force him in he's got his arms out for the side like holding the inside of the, the door and he's like uh, I'm pushing him in like and he's fighting back. <laughs> so um yeah it's the same when he, he goes for a shower as well. I put him in the shower and he just like he ain't having it I've got to pin him down and shower him <laughs> but I'm sure he likes it really. Yeah no he's he's a big guy. He's uh, I can imagine he's gonna be a handful we've got a life jacket for douglas and i mean he hates that um so i imagine trying to get a german shepherd into one yeah he can swim though right he doesn't really need one i might leave it i'll see i'm gonna when i go to dog training i'm gonna ask her what she drinks yeah if she said no then i'll just wait bother cool um uh, but i've got I'll, you know i want to take him camping i want to go camping yeah i want to go canoeing i want to take my dog with me that's why i got a dog so i could you know Go do stuff with the dog. Exactly, um, yeah. I want to go mountain biking as well, so you can run along after me. Yeah. Things like that, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Well, yeah, no, he's a little bit small. If we went, if we went cycling, probably have to put him in a little basket or something. Um, so we've got um, we've got quite a few people watching us now, Nick. So given that we're after seven o'clock, why don't we get started and. Um, just first of all, for the people that are watching, I asked a couple of minutes ago just to let us know who is in the room. We can see how many people are, but unless you are posting in the chat box, we don't know who you are. Um, so we've got Terry, obviously, John and I both know Terry. Danny's here. Um, Danny was saying that he had a chat with you a while back, Nick, on the phone. You were giving him some advice, which is cool. Um, Oksana's in the room. She and I had a couple of emails exchanged a few weeks ago. So it's good to see all of these people here. Um, but yeah, Nick, for the purposes of people who don't know you, um, maybe just give you know a couple of minutes on who you are, what your HMO background is. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm 29. Um, I bought my first HMO when I was uh, 20, just turning 21. Um, I joined the Royal Navy when I was 20. I did nine years. Um, I because of my because my work routine i was able to go on deployment save a lot of money on those deployments and i i'll come back to the uk and i buy a hmo um, so i was kind of doing that for a few years and then after that i started my company pegasus property which i'm called party is my business partner so uh, we specialize in hmo conversions uh, and lettings but we are starting to do new builds now commercial to residential conversions so we are spreading our wings a little bit um, so we're not just a one-trick pony. We don't just do HMOs, but that is where I've cut my teeth. So uh, my experience with HMOs and knowledge, uh, I feel, is a good uh, standard. So yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that's that's kind of what I'm about. Perfect. Well, I got started around about the same time as you. I think I was maybe 21, 22, so a year or two after you. But our second, well, my second ever property purchase was what turned out to be a first HMO, a mini HMO, a three bedroom one. Um, and that paid the, it was a repayment mortgage that was on. So it was paying all the bills and the mortgage of that gave me a little bit of income. 
and paid the mortgage of the house that Victoria and I were living on. And that's when it kind of dawned on me that these HMOs are pretty good income generators. And that was eight years ago, something like that. So we've both been doing this for, for quite a while. Um, Nick has gone for some serious scale. I'm definitely the tortoise in this race, but um, we've got we've got a few in and around the Northwest, predominantly based in Manchester. Um, we've got our biggest one, which is almost gonna, gonna be complete in about a month, is um, a nine bedroom, uh, which is Churchgate, which I'm sure you'll all hear me talking about in the podcast. Um, so yeah, we've got everything from, like I say, the three bed that we had up in Newcastle up to nine bedrooms, commercial to resi conversions, but typically just sort of terraced houses that we'll put loft conversions on and that sort of stuff. Um, and we're just about to start another commercial conversion with John and Terry down in Macclesfield, which will be another exciting one. So yeah, hopefully plenty of experience here, plenty of people in the room. I've just noticed that Tom Henderson's here. Tom, Nick and I were having a laugh about you earlier on. He invited me on this canoe trip. Do, do, do. Sorry, says I've not paid the electric bill. You're back. I can see you. You're back. Um, okay, that means that means we will be back in a second. We're back. Yeah. Perfect. And my dog's going crazy now because someone just knocked on the door. The best timing in the world. Cool. Anyway, right. So we're back. So, um, right. Basically, how this is going to work? Nick and I are going to be here for as long as you need us or until one of us decides that the weather's too nice and we want to go to the pub. Um, but feel free to ask questions in the chat box. What we would really like to do is get a couple of you on the phone with us this evening, Gary V style, um, so that we can have a bit of a chat with you and find out exactly the roots of the question you want answered. So if anyone's up for getting on the phone with Nick and I, that would be great. Victoria will take the number off you and the chat box and give you a buzz. But Nick, first question that I want to ask, because a lot of people have been asking me this recently, and I'm really curious to get your opinion on it, is about, I guess, quite a macro topic in the HMO world. The thoughts of the HMO market getting saturated, there being too much competition, not enough demand. It's something that I'm sure you get asked about all the time as well, but maybe we can dispel a few myths and give our views on whether or not it's still a good place to be investing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it is getting saturated. That's without a doubt because, um, <laughs> you know, lots more people are doing HMO strategy now because everyone's realized what a good, you know, investment it is. So yeah, lots of people are doing HMOs but does that mean there's room for more? I think so, because I think it's a long way off. It's sort of, um, you know, the, the, the top of the curve, really. Um, that's kind of what I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm... By that, I mean, quality and, and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a lot of HMOs out there, but a lot of them uh, aren't very good. <laughs> so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of room there for doing better, I think. Um, and you know, as you get high end, higher end stuff and push the low end out of the market, and a lot of those people go back to single debt, so actually you kind of create this recycling thing that goes on. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, that's that's kind of my opinion on uh, saturation, and um, you know, it's I think it's bullshit to sit there and say, oh no, it's not getting saturated because it clearly is. Yeah. <laughs> it clearly is getting saturated, like anything that's good. Uh, lots of people do it. Um, you know, like, but like I said, there's still lots more room to. To make money in the HMO industry, I don't think it's dead. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's got years and years and years left in it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I agree. I think it's going to be it's going to be around forever. There will always be a demand for that type of accommodation. I think you're absolutely right. Like 
there are a lot more properties on the market now than there were when we first started doing HMOs, and that does change the dynamics of the market. Yeah, but a lot, of them, a lot of them are crap, aren't they? Exactly. They're in and they're not done up to a good standard. And you know, if you if you get a HMO in the right location to the right standard and the rent is the right price, you're going to rent it out. No yeah. matter what, you know, it's, it's there's only so many houses in certain areas where the tenants want to live. Yeah. So. We've had we've had a number of tenants that have come to view our properties recently, and they have viewed half a dozen, a dozen in a day in the area that we we're operating in, and they've said to us, "This is the only one that we'd even consider." Now, a couple of our HMOs are, you know, they've been up and running for a few years. They're not the the most modern thing on the market. They are not all fantastic. We like to think that they're all done to a high quality. We spend a lot of money on the fundamentals of the renovation, but you know some of them could maybe do with a lick of paint or new carpets or whatever else. But even having said that, ours still seem to be standing out head and shoulders above the rest. So I don't think it takes a huge amount of effort to stand out if you spend your money wisely. But equally, you know, I think a lot of people think, well, you know, my time couldn't support 50 HMOs. If you're just doing it for yourself, if you're not going after the kind of Nick Leatherland Pegasus property model of becoming a managing agent as well, you only need a couple of HMOs to replace an income. And I think there's demand everywhere for a couple of HMOs, as long as you make yours the best, there's always gonna be a model there that you can follow. I think you're always gonna be able to make an income from it. And as part of a diversified strategy, you know, with other single lets, maybe with a bit of development over the years, then I think it absolutely makes sense. We will always have HMOs in our portfolio. It is interesting though, I was speaking to a guy in Liverpool, um, I was interviewing him for the podcast yesterday, that'll come out in a couple of weeks, called Mike Howman. Now, he's business partner with a guy called Sean Calliker, who was on the podcast back at the very start. They built up a portfolio of 150 rooms, and they are planning on getting rid of the vast majority of them over the next couple of years and moving solely into development. The HMOs have given them a great cash flow and a great way to raise funds to plow into development. But in Liverpool specifically, they feel like the market has changed a lot. So there are some people that are pulling out in a big way. But I mean, ultimately, I think if you're looking for a couple to replace an income to give you a bit of a, an income boost, then it's absolutely still a, a strong place to be investing. Yeah, I think also just adding on to that, that about diversifying is so important. I think a lot of people that want to get into property, their their kind of priority is to replace replace their income through cash flow. Yeah. So they, uh, most sorts of people tend to look at HMO service accommodation as the initial strategy to get into. But actually, they're quite specialist strategies. Um, yeah. They're not very easy to do, and that's why all the people who are doing the training are creaming it right now because they know that. So they so everyone's doing the training and they're learning, which is really cool. Uh, and then they're going out, but then they're not necessarily making the right investment in the right area because they, you know the, the people advising them, like sources and stuff, might be just sourcing them any old crap, and um, they end up <coughs> they end up with uh, one strategy. They've just got a portfolio of loads of HMOs in one area on one street, and that's like the total opposite of diversifying. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're going to do it, you want to spread it out a bit. Maybe different cities. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of different cities maybe uh, mix it up a bit. There's other ways of generating cash flow through property, yeah. uh, not just from HMOs. So do some different strategies as well. A couple of HMOs, a bit of service accommodation, um, you know, lettings, that's what we do. We do lettings, we make good money off that. Good stuff. Um, Nick, hopefully yeah. let's, let's, let's let some people ask some questions because I reckon we could talk about this all night, but hopefully that gives people a bit of an idea of what we're looking for. Just before we jump into the questions, um, I just noticed that someone's just subscribed to our YouTube channel, which has reminded me there's a little I in like a little information button in the top right hand corner of your screen. There should be anyway. If you click on that, you should be able to subscribe to Pegasus HQ, which is Nick's YouTube channel. He does a lot of cool videos on that. Property tours, um, design ideas, you know, all sorts of different HMO related advice and property investment advice generally. And in the bottom right, there should be a little IPI logo. And if you click on that, you should be able to subscribe to our channel as well. So feel free to do that. Um, but yeah, first questions, I've got Victoria to my right, so she's going to be feeding me the questions, so if I keep looking over there, that's why you'll probably hear her talking to me as well, but have we got a first question? Yeah, first question's about the individual tax banding for the ensuite, so are you worried about it and what you're going to do if it comes into force? Okay, Not cool. from Amar. Okay, so Amar's just asked, I don't know if you heard that, Nick, but I'll just repeat it anyway. Amar is asking about... Council tax banding on individual rooms, again, it's something that a lot of people are talking about at the moment. Is it a risk? Have you seen it in your area? Do you think it's going to come into effect across the board? 
Um, I've not seen it in my area. Um, you know, I know it already exists in other councils and stuff. I don't know. I kind of think um, it is. It is um, a bit of a problem if you've got a mid-range HMO, like sort of six to eight bedrooms, for example. You know, but if you're if you're um, kind of under the five room point, or if you're a big HMO like over ten rooms, you know, you you, you can kind of swallow the cost a little bit mm-hmm. in the bigger ones, and then the smaller ones, um, you know, you won't it won't come. You shouldn't get done with that anyway. Um, but there's a lot of question marks around it. To be honest with you, I've heard people have been challenging challenging it sometimes successfully, um, just because they they think it's been interpreted wrong um, in the legislation, for example. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I just think. I think in in investment and in business, there's always a curveball thrown at you. And as a developer and as an investor, it's your job to kind of uh, overcome it in some way. Um, you know, I just I just think Clause Twenty Four uh, stamp duty going up. Everyone's just taking it in their stride, really. Yeah. And serious investors will just keep on investing and they just work around it. Uh, the people that are just here to make a quick buck, and yeah, are interested, they go find someone else that makes a better return. I think that's exactly it. It's it's a crystal ball question, like whether it'll come in or not. I've got. I've got no idea. It seems to be spreading across the UK from the south northwards and more and more places do seem to be getting trialed with it. Like Nick says, though, if it does come in, I'm not going to say yes, it'll come in across the border. No, it won't. I don't know. That's, you know, the council's decision, valuation officer's decision. They've got the authority to do it. And as a, a, a means of raising tax, it seems like a pretty easy option for them. So I would expect to see it come in more and more places but like nick says you know it's not so much will it come in or won't it come in it's how you deal with it if it does and just preparing for that uncertainty there's a lot of things that will mix up this market legislation tax changes changes in what consumers want if they want to live in shared houses anymore i think that trend is going to continue like i said earlier Um, but with the council tax specifically there seem to be a few ways that people are managing to get around it um, you, you know, we used to hear that, well, if you don't make them all on suites, you can get around it that way. I've heard a few cases now where HMOs that have a couple of communal bathrooms have still been hit with council tax banding on individual rooms. So the councils seem quite keen to pursue this. Um, but yeah, there's, there's people that are trialing a single tenancy agreement. So all tenants on a single tenancy, like with students, that seems to be one way of getting around it. That's a question you've then got to ask. What's more painful for you, having a single tenancy and all of the difficulties that come with that because strangers don't necessarily want to be jointly and severally liable for the property, for the rent, all that sort of stuff. Is that more painful than having to pay the council tax bill? Is your council open to negotiation? Because some of them seem to be. It's not a case of, yeah, band on every room. They're saying, well, we want to make a little bit more out of this. So maybe we'll do some sort of somewhere in the middle. I think it's a case by case basis, but start planning it into your figures if you're concerned about it see if the deals still stack up with higher council tax bills see if you can increase your rent your rents if if it comes in across the board everyone's going to be hit with it though so that kind of removes the problem because everyone's going to have to deal with it everyone's rents are going to go up the same way that people are talking about the change to um application fees if if landlords can't charge their tenants application fees anymore then it looks like the rents are going to go up to factor that into it and everyone's going to be in the same situation. So, I, it, yeah, it will probably start to impact more and more of us. I don't think it's a major concern for me looking ahead, though. It's not something that's on my radar. It's something that keeps me up at night. Yeah? Cool. Okay. We have got a lot of questions all based around a very similar theme, and that is potential. So, John has asked, um, for an investment in a new area, how do I determine what a good gross yield is in a HMO and is the formula for single let yield versus HMO yield? And then Andrew has asked, how do you assess a potential property when you're thinking about turning it into a HMO? Is there a way of estimating your costs in your yield? Okay. Um, so people, I think people okay. are asking about how you... So let's start with the let's start with the area first of all, Nick. Then, if you're if you're looking at a new area, and as I suppose as you expand across Stoke, you've got to start thinking about where do we go from here. I know you're looking at places like Crewe and maybe Congleton areas around Stoke. So, how do you determine which of those areas have got potential as an HMO investment? Yeah, I mean, some of it's kind of obvious, isn't it? I mean, if you've got a hospital, then or warehouses or retail city centre locations, things like that. They're the really obvious places. I've seen people do HMOs on the outskirts of town which have good off-road parking. So those appeal to the, the, the drivers. 
Um, so, you know, HMOs can work anywhere, I guess, as, as long as you've got good off-road parking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you do one on the outskirts of town with no off-road parking, you're probably going to struggle to do it. Um, but it's just, obvious, it's just obvious things like probably not in a council estate, um, yeah. probably not in suburbs, things like, you know, unless there's good off-road parking, of course, but there normally isn't. Um, so with regards to kind of finding new areas, um, I read the new newspapers, a lot of the local newspapers, I'm keeping my finger on the pulse, uh, I'm keeping my ear to the ground, um, and that's one good thing about being local. So I'm now investing in properties around those areas, knowing that the Amazon distribution centre is going to be opened and it's going to produce new jobs. So that's kind of me just keeping ahead of the curve, really, keeping ahead of the competition. Uh, something I do find is that if I go into a new area, people follow me. Uh, which is cool. Um, and most of them are, <laughs> some of them are my clients, like, you know, and, and, and I manage their properties for them, but I don't do their uh, renovations or whatever. Um, but, you know, that's that's kind of how, with regards to area, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. Uh, what about yourself? I mean, I guess you're, you're kind of Manchester where it's a bit different, right? You've got tram system, so people can live a little bit further out and get a tram in, right? Whilst the Stoke on Trent doesn't really work that way. Yeah. Uh, you might be walking distance or cycling distance. And if you're doing students as well, I mean, this is really obvious, but um, some students are quite lazy. They want to be able to fall out of bed and get into university sort of thing. So yeah. if you're doing students, um, I've seen student houses work in city centre. The uni's not in the city centre because they want to live near the nightclubs and shops, but then they'd rather do that than get the get the bus to uni every day sort of thing. So, yeah, city centre locations are really good as well. Yeah. If there's available houses, that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, cool. I um, I mean, again, a lot of similar stuff to what you're doing. We have got a few little things that we use. One thing that I like to do in particular for a new area, if we're helping someone assess the area or we're looking at exploring a new area, is like create. I, I'm quite a visual person, so I like to create what I call like a heat map. Um, and what we do is we get um, a map of the area. Maybe it's you know a couple of miles across, um, and we start putting at, like Photoshop or you know. X, like Coral Draw, whatever kind of photo editing software that you've got. Um, there's free ones online. Get a, try to get a circle that's maybe about a quarter of a mile across in radius. So get the little scale in the bottom corner of the map and try to create a circle that's roughly a quarter of a mile. So I feel like a quarter of a mile is easy walking distance. Uh, Present to everyone. Wow. What? Rob Tomlin said, right enough, guys, this is not a advice, I'm afraid. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, bye, Rob. See you in a bit, Rob. Yeah. Douchebag. No session. Why not?
Okay, we should hopefully be back in a second. Yep, I'm coming back up, I think. Yay! Nick, we are back. Oh. Cool, okay. Um, I'll tell you what, um, I have done, I've recorded a whole video on, um, just to kind of take us back to what we're doing on location, I've recorded a whole video on picking a location. So given that we just lost five minutes, rather than revisit old ground, I'll just send a link out to that video. Um, it's part of like a little HMO course that we have done in the past, but I'll send it out to everyone that's joined the call tonight. Um, and then you can go through that. And if you've got any other questions on it, it goes through the whole heat map process and a whole bunch of other things. So um, it's probably like 10, 15 minutes long, but that'll answer the question and it means we can crack on. So yeah, um, the next part of that, I guess then was uh, how we how we assess potential like specific properties. If you picked your area and you're looking at properties, how you then determine whether or not that's a good deal. You there, Nick? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Glad to see you were engaged. I'm saying. I was reading, I was reading, I was reading the comments, sorry. All right. Okay. Um. So yeah. Aside from once, once you picked your location, you're trying to do deal analysis on a specific property. What sort of things are you looking for there to determine if it's a, a good investment? Yeah. So um, I'm basically the main thing I'm looking for is the layout of the property. That's really, really important. So we try and buy um, Victorian properties, ideally the end terrace properties. What set these apart from the mid terrace properties is that as you're walking through the front door, you've normally got um, you've normally got a hallway that goes off to the back of the house. So you, you can effectively have two reception rooms downstairs, which would have been a lounge and a dining room, and you don't walk through them. So in mid terrace is you walk into a, a reception room effectively. Mm -hmm. So trying to turn that into a bedroom, you end up having to put a stud wall there to make a walkway, which reduces the size of the room. So end terrace is being wider. Um, you know, we can get normally two bedrooms downstairs with on suites. And then we can get all our bedrooms on the first floor and then sometimes we do a loft conversion as well or an extension so we get quite a few rooms into these victorian properties um you must you must be at this stage now though where i guess you're, you're thinking more about the layout but it must have taken you a while to understand the costs and the the financial side of things to get comfortable with that now you'll know exactly what a room will rent for in stoke how much it'll cost to renovate it but how did you get to that was it just kind of trial and error initially having to do deals to figure that out um uh, kind of i mean i use mathematics so um what i did was is i saw what the average conversion was for uh the conversion cost of say a two bedroom house that we convert into a three bedroom mini hmo mm -hmm. um, which would have say one room on the ground floor and two rooms upstairs um, and um, I, I basically just took the square meterage of the property um, and you can do that by downloading the EPC from the EPC register and it will tell you on there what the total square meter of the property is and then divided that by the average room size, um, sorry by the number of rooms in that house and that gave me a number. Um, so for a four bed the average was around 100 square meters for the house so that gave me an average of 25 square meters per bedroom and that includes all the communal spaces as well. Mm -hmm. So if I was looking at a big fixed wiring property or a commercial building, <clears throat> I could divide the total square meters by uh, 25 to determine the number of rooms I could get in there. I could then multiply the number of rooms based on a conversion cost. So um, I don't do it by room actually, I do it by per square meter. Yeah. So for uh, a commercial to residential conversion, which has document E and insulation upgrading, document E being soundproofing, etc. You're probably looking at about £750 per square metre, uh, plus VAT at 5%, because it's a HMO conversion, mm -hmm. so that's cheaper. Um, I got this number for using quantity surveyors to determine the costs for me, and having done projects myself at those costs. So I'll work backwards from there. What, so, what about on a residential house, have you got a cost per square metre? I think we worked this out on a couple of different case studies with a few other guys in the group, and I think we got to about £500 a square metre for a normal resi conversion. It really depends on lots of things like what part of the country are you in, <laughs> you know, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, we, we kind of got to about uh, £350 per square metre, okay. which was for um, a, a small sort of um, HMO conversion. And then it went up to about £500 for the kind of um, six bedroom, six on suite Victorian property yeah. kind of conversion. Uh, up to £750 plus 5% VAT for commercial or residential, which has all of the document e soundproofing and um, insulation upgrade included as well. That's kind of the top dollar really. 
Um, and it's very similar to working out a new build. When people talk about new builds or extensions, they say, yeah, 1,200 pounds a square meter. It's the exact same thing. So you could go download the EPC for a property you're looking at. So it's 100 square meters. Mm -hmm. uh, multiply that by 500 pounds and you get 50 grand sort of thing. You know? yeah. And that's, and that's, but that's really, 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 um, so it's just it's just like a, a rule of thumb. Yeah, it's, it's nothing more than that. It's a way that you can just quickly look at a property, go layouts bang on, areas bang on. It's yeah. about fifty grand for based on my calculations. Happy days. Mm -hmm. You know, next thing you know, you get the builder in and he says, "Well, actually, you need a new roof. Actually, it's got you know the foundations back, blah blah blah." And then the cost goes up or it goes down. Um, you know, my five hundred pound is kind of a little bit over what we'd actually spend. Yeah. So it's got contingency built into it. Yeah. Um, but I've always said, if you stack a deal and the numbers work using very cautious numbers, it can only get better from there. If you do everything in worst case scenario, like bottom rents, top uh, dollar for renovation, etc., and it still stacks, you know, it, it can only it can only get better from there. And well. when you when you're doing your deal analysis on something that you've found on Rightmove or through an agent or wherever. What sort of figures are you looking at? What's your target? Have you got a target ROI? Have you got a target monthly income you want from a property before you give it the okay? Yeah, I mean, um, I, not in particular with regards to um, sort of cash flow. It just it just totally depends on number of rooms. I try not to do anything below four rooms because it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. Although we do do three bedroom stuff just because it's you know it's very you know picking a house up like fifty grand so it's yeah. super cheap. So it's like why not? But um, yeah, you know, anything below sort of four rooms is a bit of a no-go in the HMO world because you, you need those first couple of rooms to cover the overheads and the rest is profit. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to things like ROIs, I don't use yield, I only use ROI. I think yield's got too many variables in it when you're calculating it. You know, every single person I speak to calculates it in a different world. Yeah. Like, therefore, it's not a very um, accurate um, um, formula for me to use. So I prefer to use ROI. So um, I work on a minimum ROI of 25%. Okay. Um, and a lot of my clients have minimum ROIs of 20%. Some have 10%. Everyone's got different levels of... Yeah, so it's whatever you're comfortable with, really. What's that? I'm saying it's got to be whatever you're comfortable with. Like you say, some people might be happy making 15%, but then you've got to factor in the risk and the things might change. And, you know, 20% seems to be a pretty good baseline for people who don't know what to expect. I'd say if you're getting above 20% on a deal then you know a lot of people would consider that to be acceptable well if you look at a lot of turnkey stuff which is you know it's where you buy the house and it's already furnished and tenanted um they've taken all the risk out of it because they've bought it they've renovated it they're taking all the risks mm -hmm. and now they're selling you a turnkey hmo so people that do turnkey you know a lot of them only expect a 10 percent roi you know return on their money yeah um, because they're, cause they're getting there's no risk involved but most property developers like ourselves, we're happy to take that risk and get the capital gains by buying it yeah. cheap, renovating it, getting the capital up, lifting it. Some people don't want that. Some people just want nice, easy solution. Tenants are there. It's been rented out for a couple of months. It's steady. And they're happy to take 10% ROI on that. Yeah. You know, whilst developers like ourselves want more, like, you know, I want 25% as an absolute minimum. Yeah. Um, I mean, a big, a big thing for me is how much... Sorry, a big thing for me is how much cash, how much of my cash I can get back out. Because what I want to be doing is recycling it and not necessarily having to leverage to the the highest value. You can get eighty five percent mortgages. A couple of our HMOs are on eighty five percent mortgages, but that's not necessarily what I mean. It's it's you know how much cash can you get out of the deal so that you can move on to the next one without necessarily having to borrow that eighty five percent. And again, it's finding that that balance point. But property for me is all about where is the money going to come from for the next deal? So whilst the ROI is important, if it's a case of, well, it's 18, well, it would be an, it would be an infinite ROI if we got all of our money back out. But, you know, if it was a slightly lower ROI, but, you know, because it was a small property, but we were able to get most of our money back out, that would appeal to me just as much as a, a higher ROI on a, a bigger deal that might have a chunk of cash left in it. Um, but we, we used to work, I don't know if you ever worked out like a kind of cost per bedroom. We used to aim for... 25 grand per bedroom finished cost so a five bedroom we want to spend no more than 125 grand finished six bed 150 grand finished that's not the case anymore it went up to 30 grand it's probably now about 35 grand a room finished and it seems to keep going up as the the market increases both the cost of contractors and trades goes up and the cost of pr buying property goes up but it's good in your area to get an idea of what you're willing to spend per bedroom and that comes from knowing your renovation costs knowing your purchase prices and knowing the rental values that you can get from it as well that'll help you figure out the target roi and then work backwards to 
a per room price. But if you know what that per room price is, it's very easy walking around the house. If it's a five bed and it's on the market at 125, it doesn't leave you much money to renovate it. So if it's a dump, you know straight away without even looking at a, a deal analysis spreadsheet that it's not going to stack up. Um, so once you've done a few deals, you should be able to get shortcuts like this to enable you to assess a deal from your desktop without wasting time going to view a whole bunch of stuff that's never going to make any sense. This, this is it. And I mean, just quickly adding on to that about, um, you know, what you're saying about getting your cash out in momentum investing, you know, sort of recycling your cash. Um, you know, lots of people, lots of people investing at the lower end of the level of the market. Uh, what I mean by that is, is people doing the mini most. So there's also going to be a lot less money in there when, when it comes to refinancing and getting your money back out because you're not going to get a commercial revaluation. Mm -hmm. But when you start looking at, um, you know, like we're doing a pub conversion into nine flats, that's pretty much all money out. Um, you know, we're doing a 32 bed HMO, that's all money out. Um, things like that, you know, when you do big projects, there's there's less competition, there's a lot more profit margin, there's more money to be made. Yeah, but for sure. Money buying it and the doing up bit is way more expensive as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, like with anything, you know, as you, as you invest it at a higher level, the, the profit margin goes up too. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if, if, if you're expecting to get all your money back out on, you know, sort of five bedroom HMOs and stuff, it's probably not going to happen, to be honest with you. Yeah. I think <laughs> so as well, I, I mean, I totally agree with that, but it's, it's, it's also made me think, you know, when you're saying about getting all your money back out on bigger deals, I think a lot of people have got, these absurd expectations you know they, they see they read ypn they listen to a podcast and they're like oh so and so is making 1500 pounds or two grand a month from an hmo so i want my four bedroom terrace to make 1500 pounds a month like having one property that makes you even 500 pounds a month six seven eight hundred pounds a month that's a lot of money from a single property and i think with the market heating up, people are going to need to start accepting lower returns or looking for a different strategy. So it's maybe worth thinking about what your kind of you know baseline is, what you are going to be happy with, and, and reass reassessing what that is because the market is changing. I'm sure prices will come down again at some point in the future. But you know, as it stands up here, we're thinking we're having to have that discussion. Do we want to keep investing for a lower return? Or are we just going to sit on the fence and see what happens for the next couple of years? Um, you know, I, I think I think it is. You know, everyone's got this kind of thousand pound plus as a benchmark in their head, but you know, seven fifty, eight hundred quid a month, I think, is still a very good deal. So I wouldn't be writing them off, even if it is, you know, eighteen percent or whatever. Cool. Have we got another question? We got someone right, Nick. We're gonna we're gonna try and get someone on the phone. Let me. Uh, this is, this is going to end terribly. I mean, I can barely keep two of us on the call. Let's see how we do with three people. It's ringing. Hey, who's that? Hey, Andrew. It's Mike. I want to do the whole, you're on the Ask Gary V show, but you're obviously not. You're on the, the Mike Stenhouse and Nick Latherland show. How's it going? Good. What? What? Um. Aside. Aside from all the technical issues, what question have you got about HMO investing for Nick? Um. What I'd like to give an absolute starter in HMOs. Um. I'm looking at Salford at the moment, and I've spoken to a couple of estate agents who seem to say that the market's getting a bit oversaturated. Mm -hmm. So, um, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on that as well as what advice you should actually give to a starter uh, what are the biggest lessons learned um what are the biggest kind of like signs where you've seen a property and you think no it's definitely not a good idea for a h i know you mentioned like a few areas in terms of like a few points in terms of victorian house and terrace things like that um yeah it's just any general advice you'd actually give a starter Okay, I mean Salford is is pretty close to me, Andrew. Um, I know the area well. We've run it. Help people renovate a lot of houses there. We used to manage quite a few there when we had the Latin agency. It's an area I'm a little bit reluctant to be positive on. There is a lot of property there. Is there any reason? Like, do you live there? Is there a reason that you want to invest there over other places? Um, I've got a friend there. He's got a couple. So okay. I thought because of the contact he's got, it might will make it a lot easier. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it would, but Manchester is not a massive place. I'm sure those contacts would be willing to, you know, whether it's an agent or, uh, you know, a contractor, a builder, whoever, I'm sure they'd be willing to travel out with Salford. Um, my, part of my concern with Salford is property prices. For the areas where yeah. I think HMOs are in demand, uh, you know, we've seen them shoot up in 18, 24 months by 20, 30 grand. 
and I feel my, my belief is that a lot of that increase has come from competition amongst HMO investors. A lot of the agents in Salford, and I don't know if people are seeing this in other areas, they're advertising every three bed terraced house as potential to be an HMO. So the agents have cottoned on to this. Prices have gone up. My fear is that if the HMO market ever changes, there aren't going to be any local, only, you know, by um, single, like, um, what am I trying to say here? Um, owner occupiers who want to pay those prices, they can't afford to, it's not really what the properties are worth. I, I feel like they're being overinflated by this competition. Um, and if the HMO market does ever change, those prices aren't gonna hold up a huge amount. So yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit negative on Salford, but I think there's plenty of areas around there. Uh, I mean, six to 12 months ago, Eccles was a bit of a branch out from Salford. Even that's getting quite hot now. You know we're in Stockport, which is just around the M60. Um, that's a pretty good area. But again, the the two Robs were saying that Stockport's the next kind of buy to let hot spot. So that might start to get a lot of competition now. Um, but I mean, I think Salford's probably one of the the most overinflated places in in Manchester at the moment. Um, it might continue. There, there is some potential for it because you've got Media City there. You've still got a lot of people moving there. But I, I just feel like there's a lot of stock that is kind of stagnated a little bit. Um, so, I, yeah, I'd, I'd be a little reluctant to advise on Salford. Okay, yeah, that sounds really interesting because um, I was looking at the... I just did a quick jump onto Spare Room and just looked at the number of properties on available to let, but there's a number of people, and there still seem to be a massive... Um, a, a huge, huge uh, number of actual people compared to actual rooms. But yeah, I, I get your point. In terms do, you know, of, do you know? I mean, roughly how many are you talking? What's the sort of ratio you're looking at? I think there was about eight hundred people looking for rooms, and about I think two hundred or three hundred. Well, okay, rooms so rooms advertised. Yeah, I mean that that still sounds okay. Um, I haven't. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to backtrack here. I still, I still wouldn't be looking to invest in Salford myself. But you know, maybe things have slowed down a little bit. It was the case when we were renovating properties there that there were three or four on every street with skips outside getting turned into HMOs. But I mean, Nick, you're you're in Stoke, which in my eyes is probably so, yeah, similar to Salford in that there's a lot of HMOs in a relatively small area. You own or manage you know, the far majority of them, but you're still investing there. So maybe maybe you've got a different slant on the kind of saturation point in an area. Uh, yeah, I think for a start, I think them um, spare room KPIs um, that people run, you know, the key the key performance indicators that people run on spare room, I think it's total bullshit anyway. Um, you know, I've been running those KPIs for years on spare room and um, I don't see any correlation between those and sort of supply and demand in the market. I mean, something you've got to bear in mind is that, you know, you might see one HMO being advertised, but that HMO has actually got six rooms in it. Yeah. So, so you actually, you know, it might say there's 100 rooms available, but actually that's like 500 rooms. And then not everybody that's looking for a room is registered on spare room is looking for a room either. So it's kind of, it gives you a good idea of how many rooms are on the market, but with regards to how many tenants are available, that's very hard to measure. Um, I mean, you can download things like, not download, sorry, you can ask the council to send you the uh, HMO register so you can find out where all the HMOs are. And then they're all the licensed ones up that are, the, the licensed ones are registered with the council because of licenses. So uh, you can actually request that information. So it gives you a bit of an idea on how many HMOs exist in an area anyway. Um, I, if also, if you Google something like, um, if you Google Stoke on Trent demographic, it tells you there's 20,000 students in the city. So it kind of gives you little ideas. Um, you know, you can you can uh, ring HR departments of big employers and ask them yeah, how many people do you employ. They tell you because it's not it's not top secret or confidential. Um, you know, it's all readily available information online. But just doing some really basic due diligence and research, you can actually find a lot of information, and you can use that to kind of correlate some sort of data um, that you can use to determine sort of if that if that area is really saturated or not. Or just a really basic way of doing it, even more basic, is go on spare room and just save a certain advert and just follow it. Once a day, click on there, see if they've rented a room out or not, how long it's taken them to rent that room out. We call it DOM, which is days on market. That's a KPI that we use to measure how long a room is on the market for. So I've got my own DOMs for my own properties. I've got DOMs for my clients' properties. I've got DOMs for properties that I'm not managing, but I'm looking at on spare room. So I'm able to sort of measure 
And you can see patterns in times of the year where it's slower, other times where it's quicker. You can use that to actually um, determine when a good buying time is, when a good selling time is, when a good time is to drop the rents down, when a good time is to put the rents up. Um, you know, so all this data is there for you to use. Um, you know, just go go and use it, basically. Um, I don't think it's something that people really teach. I just think it's um, it's something that I just do myself. Um, you know, <laughs> does that kind of answer the question? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that's quite a good point. In terms of it's all about how you interpret the the actual data right that's quite a good point yeah i I think you know nick just going back to one of the things that nick mentioned when he said you know you could see you could have 200 adverts for for properties on there andrew but each of them could have four or five rooms that could be a thousand rooms available and 800 (laughs) people looking the the other thing with spare room the stats are again another reason why they're a little bit awkward is those 800 people they could be registered for anywhere in Greater Manchester. So you could find that 200 of them are looking South Manchester, 200 East, 200 Central, 200 West. Uh, and on that, that doesn't even leave you North Manchester. So they, although they, they might be registered for Salford, they might actually be interested in Ashton. They might actually be interested in Stockport. Um, and I, it, it's, it's, a, it's an okay kind of base metric. Um, but you know, get your feet on the street. Is, you, is your friend still renting rooms? Because you know he's the one that's got stock there. Nick and I can you know extract uh, ex- postulate on this as much as we like. But if he's got rooms there and he's still renting them well, then you know maybe there is something to be said there. Um, our builder just completed his first HMO in Eccles, uh, five bedrooms, all of them rented out within a week. Um, so you know, but he didn't get the rents that he thought he would because they've softened a little bit since he bought it. Um, so you know, there's 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 ups and downs everywhere. Like I say, I think there's there are areas that are potentially better than Salford. Um, but if you you know if if it's the only place that you want to to go, then yeah, I'm sure you can still make it work. You just need to put in extra effort to to set it apart. Um, you were saying you were asking as well about you know top tips for a newbie. Have you got? I mean, what is your property background? Have you got any experience, or is is an HMO going to be your first investment? HMLB Good. Um, speak to a broker and make sure you can get finance. I'd say is the first thing you want to do. You've maybe already done that. Yeah, I've already refinanced uh, current properties. So I've got a hefty deposit to use for uh, a few properties, but um, haven't actually. Oh, I actually spoke to a broker to get a uh, about the potential for mortgage. Yeah, and he said it's all good so far because I've got the I've got like one hundred and fifty k. I just thought I found. Is that is that a, a mortgage broker who's familiar with HMO products? Because you you might find without uh, an investment track record, um, and again, Nick will know this from a lot of the clients he's worked with, but without a track record, it can be more difficult to get a mortgage. So the last thing I want you to do is plow that 150 grand into buying a property cash, hoping that you can refinance it in six months and then find out that nobody's going to lend you it because you've got no experience. Um, so speak to a broker that knows what they're talking about. It'd probably be the first thing to do. Nick, any other tips for you to get started? Yeah, I mean, everyone talks about things like power team all the time, but, you know, it, it's, it's a bit cliche, but it's really true. If you go, if you go and have a five-minute conversation with an accountant or a broker or another developer, you probably find that there's other people in your area that, even though they're potentially competition, some people will meet you for a coffee, or you can go and meet people that are in a different area to you whatsoever that have got no issues with telling you things and I did that for, for years like you know I was always meeting people for coffee exchanging ideas and learning off each other and that's how I learned you know people were inviting me to their properties like they're developing and they were showing me things and I thought wow this is this is awesome like you know the property community is great um, so I'd, I'd probably say you know get involved like network loads try and meet people and um, see if you can get around people's houses don't be don't feel don't feel cheeky asking just saying look can I come and have a look at your HR that you're renovating Go there with a notepad and pen, write down, ask loads of questions, write down loads of notes. That's the best way of learning, I think. Yeah. Um, rather than sitting in the classroom. Awesome. Cool. Right, Andrew. I hope that was useful. Keep in touch. Let us know when you get that first one done, and we'll um, we'll get you on the podcast to do a little feature on how your first project went as a, a new BHMO landlord. Um, but yeah, no. Let let us know how you get on. If you've got any other questions, feel free to drop either of us an email or uh, you know catch us on Facebook or whatever. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, guys. All That's right. really awesome, and uh, great work on the podcast as well. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Catch you soon. Bye. Okay, bye. Okay, we have uh, we have another call. Um, let's do that. I thought that worked quite well. I liked Andrew. Um, 
I just need to remember my wife's password. We're on, right? We are calling Ross. Ross, if you get a call from an unknown number, don't answer. It's me and Nick. Hello. Hi, is that Ross? Ross, Ross. Sorry? Is that Ross? Ross. Yeah. Who's Ross? You're not Ross. No. Okay, sorry, mate. No, it's fine. Bye. That wasn't Ross. That was supposed to be Ross. Victoria's just chuckling to herself in the corner. Have we got another question whilst you try to get someone else on the phone? Uh, yeah, I'll just, there you go, call it. Let's call it Ross now. Who, who was that? I have no idea. You sure this is Ross? Yeah. Let's hope this is Ross. Hello? Hi, is that Ross? It is, yeah. Hi, Ross. We just spoke to someone who wasn't Ross that was very offended that I thought he was Ross. So I'm glad we've got yeah. you now. It's Mike and Nick. How are you getting on? I'm not too bad, thanks. I've just heard that there. Mike may end the match with <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea who that was. It must be Victoria's boyfriend or something. Um, so <laughs> how can we help you? What have you got going on? Um, I'm just, I'm a, a completely different section here to um, Andrew. I'm a newbie starting out, but with no money. So I'm wondering, first deal, is it a good idea to go into HMO invest in uh, rent to rent? Or should you, should a rent to rent or maybe purchase um, just a single let and what, what the advice is from, from Nick and yourself. Sure. Nick, do you want to take a stab at that? No money. It's, it's uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you go first. I couldn't really uh, hear it very well. Can okay. Just... Yeah, sure. So Ross was saying he is interested in HMO investing but has no money. He's considering doing it on a rent to rent basis, but equally, you know, if you don't think that's the right approach, what else could he be doing? And, you know, <laughs> Rent to rent is one of those things where um, it's not really something that I'm into for quite a few reasons. I just don't think it's, um, I, I like to do investment in quite a, by the book, ethical way. Mm -hmm. Not to say rent to rent is unethical. What I mean to say is, is that um, there's a lot of unknowns in there that I'm not really comfortable with. Um, and I've heard people talk about rent to rent and it doesn't really answer, you know, there's questions there that aren't really answered um, to a satisfactory standard. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to put my, um, you know, my professionalism on the line by doing rent to rent. The reasons for that is I'm not going to start slagging rent to rent off or anything because I know lots of people do it in a, in a really um, good way. Um, but essentially, if the property's got a mortgage on it, you know, it's probably against the terms and conditions of that mortgage for them to do a rent to rent. It's as simple as that, really. If the property's unencumbered, then they can do what the hell they want with it, and that's great. Um, but there's lots of people out there doing rent to rent where they're getting the landlord to sign a contract which says that. Um, if if it turns out that it is against the terms and conditions and they get repossessed, it's not your it's not your problem basically. And there's just something about that, that doesn't sit well with me. Uh, but that's just based, that's just my opinion. Um, however, rent to rent can be done in a way which is is I'd say properly. Um, you know, such as unencumbered properties, that sort of thing. Um, um, also, I mean, other ways of making money in HMO or in property in general, where you don't have much money to start off with. Is probably doing things like uh, managing other people's properties for them. Like lettings is is quite easy to set, is is easy and cheap to set up these days. Um, Ross, so, are you sorry, Ross? Are you are you the same Ross that uh, did we did we speak a couple of weeks ago? Yes, I don't think you'd speak to too many people called Ross from Northern <laughs> Ireland, mate. Well, it was, it was when I heard the accent, I was like, <laughs> hang on a second. So yeah, so Nick, just for some background, Ross and I spoke. Ross, do you mind me saying what you do as a job? No, so, on, yeah. Nick Ross works in an estate and letting agents, kind of Northern Ireland, um, and we had a chat a couple of weeks back, and I thought that that could actually position him well to, you know, if there were any properties that came on, it might give him some insight into, you know, landlord situations, whether they are, you know, he can he can have a more open conversation with some of the landlords than Joe Bloggs might be able to. Um, so I thought, you know, with his situation there, it might help. But yeah, crack on now. Just what you were saying about managing other properties and stuff, I thought it was relevant to know that. I mean, I mean, I mean, look, you know, lots of people doing rent to rent, and I'm not one to judge. So whatever, do what you want. But um, Mike's totally right. If you're letting and you're doing a state agency, you're very, very, very well positioned because um, people will be coming to you asking to sell their properties. Um, you know, people will be coming to you asking you to rent their properties. You might know people that are struggling to rent those properties. And they're kind of the ideal people, really. You know, it's people who have got houses which are in bad condition and they're having nightmare tenants and they just can't be bothered with it anymore. Um, you know, it's a lot of them are unencumbered. They're older sort of folk as well. They're perfect people. We can go to them and say, let's do a deal. You know, rent me the house and then I'll rent it out to other people and I'll do it up for you as well and spend the, the absolute minimum amount of money 
and generate cash flow that way. Mm. And I mean, another quick thing that's quite interesting is if you look at companies like Uber Taxis, they're the biggest taxi firm in the world, but they don't own any taxis kind of thing. You know, Amazon are the biggest retail firm in the world, but they don't own shops. It's all about, it's all about controlling, not ownership. You know, ownership has risks that come with it. Um, whilst uh, controlling that is the best is the best business model in my opinion. So if you can do rent to rent and control the property and make all the money, but not have all the stresses of having um, you know potentially the ownership of the property and what that entails with the market changing, <laughs> you kind of throw well positions. Really, you're making all the money, but you've got none of the stresses. Yeah, you know, so I think rent to rent's an awesome model. There's just a lot of unknowns in there that I'm not comfortable with personally. So yeah. I make. I make plenty of money off other strategies, so I'm not really bothered about rent to rent. But if I was a newbie or I was wanting, wanting to get into property, that's probably a very good way to get into it. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd go along with I'd go along with that. I think I mean Ross, we've obviously spoken about this in the past, but with with rent to rent, I think as Nick has said, it can work. It can be very lucrative. It can be very profitable. I've interviewed enough people who are doing very well from it. A couple of things for anyone listening who's thinking about rent to rent is A, make sure you're doing it the right way. It's not worth jeopardizing your livelihood. It's not worth jeopardizing other people's properties. Um, it's saying my connection's unstable. Am I still there? Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not worth it's not worth the risk to do it badly. So a lot of people think it's a, a kind of cheap route into property investing, and it can be. But you still want to make sure you've got the right legal agreements in place that you're doing things in the right way. Um, equally, I don't th necessarily think that it's a business that you want to be thinking. Yeah, this is going to be my whole future. The smart people I know who are doing rent to rent are rather than using the profit from the rent to rent portfolio to live off, they're reinvesting that rent to rent portfolio in buying assets. So they're starting off with rent to rent because they don't have the capital, but rather than spending and frittering it away on holidays and handbags and whatever else, they are saving that and then using the cash flow to actually physically acquire properties. So they're starting to grow their portfolio that way. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, Ross, we've said this before, Nick said it as well. You're in a great position. Make sure you've got the blessing of the, manager whoever's you know the owner of the firm um, but i think if you went to him you're obviously a switched on guy make some proposals to him maybe you know you could start looking at offering an hmo management service that you can take over and you know start getting a, a commission on that rather than just working for you know getting a wage for an hourly rate um you know help, help him build his business and if he's a good guy you know you might be able to start getting into property investment that way whilst looking at ways that you can grow a rent through rent portfolio, save up money for a deposit on a place, whatever that might be. Yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant. Cool. Right, well, I'll uh, we'll move on. Obviously, you've got my number anyway, or else you've got my email address. I'm sure we'll speak again in the not-too-distant future, but hopefully that was helpful for you tonight. Okay, that's good. Thanks, good stuff. Thanks, Cheers, Ross. Catch you later. Okay, Nick, a couple of questions on kind of internal layouts and stuff. On suites, yes, no, how many? Yes, as many as possible. Uh, <laughs> with, with no with no limit. One per room. Do you, <laughs> yeah, fair. Do you, do you think have you got any desire to keep any communal bathrooms for the whole council tax banding debate, or do you not think that's uh, an issue? I think at the minute the market wants on suites, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not to say that uh, in a couple of years' time, for whatever reason, we might have to go, you know, get rid of on suites, for example, because of council tax banding, etc. But um, I mean, from a, from a from a ROI perspective, you know, if you're doing an on suite, you're probably looking at two and a half thousand, three thousand pound per um, per green really per on suite. So that it does mount the cost up massively, and then also you're looking at um, upgrading the heating system potentially to, you know, like a, a mega flow, like a, a unfenced cylinder tank systems. All these things have massive costs on to doing on suites. So when you look at the ROI of doing an investment on like the whole on suite, way well, actually kills the ROI massively. If you could just put like two or three bathrooms in there instead, it's so much cheaper. And is is that the case yeah. though? Because I mean, we look at we look at HMOs, similar sort of cost to you, two and a half grand, you know, per ensuite to install. Maybe some additional costs, like you say, in upgrading the boiler and stuff. But if we get even fifty quid a month, and maybe this is the difference. Maybe you don't get as much of an uplift on your rooms. But if we get fifty quid per month per ensuite. That's six hundred pounds a year, which is about a twenty-four percent ROI on your two and a half grand investment. So, you know, if, if your house is making you twenty-one percent, an ensuite's going to increase that ROI. It's it's a as far as I'm concerned, it's a pretty good ROI. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally get what you're 
saying also it does make the room more appeasing. So I am very much for um, I am very much for doing on suites. So yeah. Exactly. All I'm saying is is that you know you can you can do the refurb a lot cheaper if you don't do on suites. Yeah. No. Uh, of course. But the, the difference in rental income is is you know like you say six hundred pounds a year, which if you spend it two and a half grand. But someone else you've got to bear in mind is you're also looking at all the ongoing maintenance and potentially you might have to rip it out and redo it every sort of five or so years. So yeah, there, there is a few extra things added in there, I suppose. But ultimately, I'd say on suites is the way ahead. I know some people disagree. Julian Maurice from Icon Living massively disagrees with on suites. Yeah, um, he, he's got very good reasons why he's against them. But his main reasons are that it doesn't work in his market that well, or it doesn't. It's not required in his market, and that's cool. And that's kind of what the answer is to that question: is on suites or not? The, the, the answer is is it, it depends on your area. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you're in like a mining town and everyone's used to you know, washing in um, bathtubs outside, then, you know, that's probably cool. But if you're in somewhere like Manchester or, or wherever, people have got, people want to live in a, in a room, a nice room with an ensuite, simple yeah. as that. People don't want to share toilets and, you know, all that, all that carry on life. People don't want it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the way we're heading. You know, people want, people want a bit more luxury. Yeah. HMO is becoming higher end. I mean, don't forget that, you know, sort of 10, 15 years ago, a HMO was very low end very, very low end part of the market. And a lot of councils still see HMO as low end. So when you go to a council and say, well, actually I do high end for professionals, they go, what's that? You know, they don't know what it is, especially in Stoke. You know, we showed them some pictures of uh, some of our HMOs and they were like, oh, well, who, why would people live in these? You know, and we were like, yeah, doctors and nurses and people like that live in these HMOs. Why would they do that? They can rent a house to themselves, they're on loads of money. And we were like, well, that, question that uh, you asking that question is the whole reason you don't understand the HMO market mm. you know we have to explain it to them that they want to rent a flat for a year they don't want to sign up to Virgin Internet for a 12 month contract they don't want to park they don't they can't a lot of them can't pass some credit checks and reference checks because they're foreign they just you know they live in this mobile lifestyle they got to go to where the work is and the HMO is just an extension of a hotel really yeah um you know so I say I say you know I'm not in the HMO business I'm in the hotel business I'm in the hospitality business I run my HMO to like hotels yeah. uh, with welcome packs and cleaners doing the laundry for them and ironing and all these additional items that they want. Um, you know, and that's what I would consider to be high end and an ensuite is a definite must. Cool. For us. Okay. Um, and then room sizes. Now, obviously there is a, a kind of national space standard guide that says six and a half, soon to be 6.7 square meters for a single bedroom, round about 10 square meters for a double bedroom. Um, they're the minimum sizes. You can make a 6.7 square meter single bedroom feel pretty cool if you kit it out with the right furniture and storage and everything. And equally, a 10 square meter bedroom that's got enough furniture in it's still going to look crap. So it's not necessarily all about the room sizes. Um, I think giving people more space, again, like Nick was saying, people are looking for more upmarket stuff. Our uh, nine bedroom, we had to make some bigger rooms, although they were all well above the minimum space standards, the councillors didn't like the look of them. So we had to combine a couple of bedrooms. So we've got some like 17, 18 square meter bedrooms. Some of them are 18 square meters plus a walk-in wardrobe plus an ensuite. So they're huge. We could have made more rooms out of it. But now that we're getting close to completion, we know that they're going to be the real premium in the market. Nothing else will compete with that. And as the market gets more and more saturated, actually, I'm quite happy that we've got these big rooms. We'll put a little sofa in there. They'll feel really cool. There won't be anything else available. And we're going to get an extra 100, 150, 200 pounds a month for these rooms over what the average room rate is in our town. So, you know, if you've got space, it's not necessarily always a case of cramming in as many rooms as possible. I think as the market does mature, um, these premium offerings are going to be in demand. It's probably about having a mix in your rooms, you know, have some small rooms. People will always want to live in a nice house. So if they can't afford a big room in that house, if you've still got smaller rooms for them, but they're happy to pay a premium because you've got nice communal space, you've got Netflix accounts, you've got cleaners that'll do your laundry and ironing, like Nick said, then you can get away with small rooms, absolutely. But you know, if, you, if you've got the space, I don't think it is a case anymore of trying to cram in as many rooms as you can. What, what are you doing on, on room sizes, Nick? Have you got a minimum that you try to work towards? or? Um, not really. I mean, we, we try and just do them as big as we can. But, okay. um, the, the ensuite it does not include, it's not part of the usable floor space. So when they talk about useful floor, a usable floor space, they're talking about 
the really the main part of the bedroom. So an ensuite doesn't count. So if you've got seven square meters, your ensuite's got to be three more square meters than top, for example. So you're looking at a ten square meter space. Yeah. However, if you do a built-in wardrobe, a built-in wardrobe counts as usable space. So what Mark's saying there about using using the room to its uh, maximum um, sort of capability. When we put the stud works into doing an ensuite, we also put, put a bit extra on the end, and that becomes a walk-in wardrobe with a little door on it. And also above, we put a little suitcase storage. Little things like that are quite, you know, and then and then if you map out where the furniture is going to go in the room, you can map out where the plug sockets are going to go, and you can map out where you're going to put the TV point, you know, and, and you want it to be opposite the bed. And it's just really simple things like that. But, yeah. you know, we walk around with cancer spray paint and we spray all the furniture on the wall, on the floor. So we can see where the beds go in, where the bedside tables are, chest of drawers. We just try and use the spaces as best we can, um, and then and then we sort of work out where the walls are going to go and we build around that really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we don't we don't just build a room and try and fit things into it. Yeah. we do it we do it backwards. We put the stuff in first, i.e. the furniture by spray painting it that spray painting it down. And then we work out where the electrics are going and then where the wall is going to be formed. Yeah, I think I think you got you got to start with the end in mind. It, it stops you getting to the end of a project and realizing that you can only open the door into the ensuite halfway because it hits off the wardrobe or you know you can't plug in a lamp next to the bed because the socket's not in the right place or you can't put your chest of drawers where you wanted to because there's a radiator in the way you, you've got to be thinking about the end layout when you're starting to strip out really um also i think I, you're talking about these little design ideas ikea is great if you walk around there they've always got these like you know one bedroom apartment in 30 square meters and some of their storage ideas are great. And that's what I'm talking about. You can still make small bedrooms feel good. So if, you're, if you've got a house that's got an eight square meter room, it's not the end of the world, but spend a little bit of extra time, spend a few hundred quid putting in some nice storage touches so your tenant feels like they've got enough space and you know, you'll be able to rent that, no problem. Um, got a follow-up question about kitchenettes in, oh, that was Tom. So Tom, Henderson, hi Tom. I'm going to keep calling you out, Tom, just because you've got so much energy. I'm sure you'll be sitting there all excited. Um, kitchenettes, do you ever put them in your rooms, Nick? No, I mean, um, bed sits are kind of considered more low end around here. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's again market dependent, but uh, normally, if you're cooking in the same room as where you sleep, most people associate that with kind of um, low end. People, I found that people prefer to go to a separate space like a kitchen um, and cook their food there and then eat it there and then go back to their room again to do what, whatever they're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's that's how we, and you, you, you're certainly, certainly going to get council tax around the third room then if you put a kitchen in and on suite, you're definitely yeah. going to get council tax. So, um, you know, you've got to take that into mind as well. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I've not seen people do high end bed sits. Maybe it would work, maybe not. You know, it, I'm it, going to I'm going to do some this year, actually, some high-end bed sits and see what happens. It's interesting because I think, you know, there, there's a fine line between a bed sit and uh, a luxury studio. You know, the, the, they, could, they could be the same size. It's really just the way that you market it. If you look in London, um, and Tom, this is maybe what you're starting to think about. People like um, Nicole Bremner and Martin Skinner, they're taking this micro-living concept. And I went down to see one of Nicole's developments a couple of months back, and she is creating, I think, maybe like 15, 18 square meter studios that are fully self-contained. So it's, a, it's an apartment rather than an HMO. I think they're still including all the bills in the rent. Um, but yeah, they're pitching it as self-contained living rather than a bed sit in an HMO. And just by that kind of change in mindset, the change in the way that they're branding it and marketing it, they're getting one bedroom apartment rates for these like micro apartments rather than calling it a bed set and it's working really well for them the rents that they're getting are phenomenal um, again it comes back to design if you do it in a good way if you've got enough space for it you know if you're doing a commercial conversion it might be worth it um, you know maybe look at calling them micro apartments micro living rather than bed sits in an HMO uh, and you know if there's nothing like that in your area it's happened in New York it's now happening in London it will fil filter out um, so if you're, if you're thinking from that point of view, I think it's a really interesting concept. If you're thinking, you know, I've got a five bed terraced house and I want to stick a little, um, you know, double kitchen out of, you know, a kind of double cabinet out of magnet or Howden's in there with a microwave on it and a single ring gas or electric burner. I think, I, I don't think that's targeting the kind of either the students or 
the young professionals that is a kind of lower end rate but there's 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 something there's something to be said about kitchenettes used in in the right spaces um question on tenants nick what is your process for screening them have you got any minimum requirements in terms of like income or length of time they've been in their job and um yeah what what, what is your process for making sure someone's suitable for a house yeah, I mean, we just do credit checks, reference checks, all the usual um, checks. That we do. Do, you use a, do you use a third-party company for that? or? Yeah, yeah, we use a third-party company. I think it's let, letsafe.com. Okay. Uh, it's about 14 pounds for a check, uh, and that just comes back with a pass or fail, basically. Um, so that's, that's one way. I mean, the best way is kind of gut feeling, really. I mean, having said that, I've had some tenants where I thought they were great people, and they turned out to not be such great tenants, and, uh, you know, people's circumstances change. And what can you do, really? Um, people people come along as professionals and they lose their jobs. Now they're, they're now not a professional. And, um, you know, all you can really do is things like carrying tools is a really good way of, of ensuring that, um, you know, if you do get tenants that are <laughs> maybe younger, uh, carrying tools is normally more normal with younger tenants yeah. for various reasons, as you can imagine. Do you take um, a deposit on all your yeah. rooms? What's that? Do you take a deposit on all your rooms? No, not all of the rooms. Some rooms have no deposits. It just kind of depends on what part of the market you're going for. You know, within professionals, you've got different niches. You've got mm -hmm. kind of high end, mid range, and low range professionals. You know, white collar, blue collar, that kind of thing. Yeah. So a lot of foreign tenants because they could just get up and go anytime they want, and you can't really chase them. Yeah. Uh, you know, you only take a deposit off those people. Uh, whilst um, people in the UK, we can have a bit more leeway with get a guarantor that covers our backs. Then we mm -hmm. we can do with not having deposits. Also, when you do higher end HMOs where the rent's a lot more money, that seems to filter out a lot of the dross anyway. So, if you're charging five hundred fifty pounds for a room in Stoke on Trent or Newcastle on the line, um, you know you're, you're, you're going to be you're going to be getting all the best tenants really. I mean, but you know, there's, there's always exceptions to the rules. Just because you charge a lot of money and the person's earning a lot of money doesn't mean they're going to be a model character. Yeah, uh, necessarily. I think but, the uh, yeah, on, on the. On the deposit front, I was just going to say we yeah similar boat to you. I'd say we take deposits on most stuff, but not everything. We meet everyone that's moving into one of our houses, and it is very much a people decision rather than you know like a, a credit score only tells you so much. But if we meet them, look them in the eye, have a bit of a conversation with them, that tells us so much more than any sort of credit check is is going to tell us. Now, obviously, you get people who are savvy to that, and you know I, I'm not suggesting that we couldn't get taken in by you know a con person but i like to meet them and i like to make it a, a personal decision as much as a, a financial one and deposits can be as much of a hassle as they are a, a positive you know if you don't register it in the right way um you know you could be liable for three times the deposit as a, a fine even still if you know if you take the deposit if you register it with one of the the three deposit protection <laughs> schemes you get to the end of the tenancy and and let you know late rent is very easy to claim back for you can prove that you can show bank statements whatever else but damages to a room um you know it can be a real hassle trying to get that back and then you got to think what is your time worth for the sake of 50 quid to repaint a room is it really worth all the headaches and hassle um so you know we tend to take deposits but it's not the be all and end all and it's certainly not going to stop someone trashing the place if uh, if they're that way inclined um what about the main issues that you get contacted from tenants, Nick. What are the sort of main gripes that they've got? Or the main reasons that they're calling you or your guys? Um, yeah, so people getting locked out is the main thing. Um, so we try to systemize that by having lock boxes outside the properties. Um, so we've also got night latches now, so it's like a rollable night latch. So it means that you can't lock your bedroom door without having the key in there. Okay. So people who People always get locked out because they've gone to the kitchen and they've accidentally locked them. So, you know, the door slammed behind them. That's really common. Yeah. Um, we've got the, the night latches on now and we've got the coded boxes outside the properties and gets them in the front door. Once they're in the property, it's kind of not your problem anymore. They're, not, they're off the street. So they can either, you know, I'm a bit I'm a bit of an asshole with this, but I kind of say, if you lock yourself out at two o'clock in the morning, you can sleep on the sofa in the lounge until, until the next yeah. day when we get up or you can call the lock locksmith. Or you can kick the door through and they pay for a new door. It's like you sort of thing. Um, Very so, pragmatic uh, as always with Nick. What's that? <laughs> no, nothing, nothing. I, I think I think it's, it's it's a great approach, Nick. Oh, I think the uh, the video is pending. It says <laughs> the video is pending. 
No, I think I think we're still good. Oh, okay. Um, so the other thing is people stealing food from each other. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's a big thing. So um, I mean, you you can try and mitigate against that by putting locks on fridges, so you can have people can have their own individual fridges. Um, but I've 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 only found that it actually happens in the lower end properties. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. And another thing is just repairs, really. Um, yeah, we get you know tenants contact us for repairs. We're always in contact with our tenants. We also use Arthur Online, so our tenants can report maintenance issues through Arthur Online. Um, so that's that's quite cool as well. So we like to keep on top of maintenance. We do a lot of inspections. Our cleaner does inspections for us as well yeah. every week when she cleans. Um, so they're the three main things for us. Yeah, so, so similar for us. We we don't get so much food getting stolen, um, but. People getting locked out is the main one, and it's always when I'm on holiday. So, like you, lock boxes are the way forwards, and uh, a clause in the tenancy saying that um, call outs for being locked out of the property will be a, a fifty quid fee, an eighty quid fee, whatever, whatever you think is is fair. Um, at least it kind of softens the blow a little bit, and a lot of them will just bunk on the sofa, right? or or they'll just remember to take their keys if they think that you're their personal locksmith and you're going to drive down there whenever they forget their keys in the office then are going to use that if they know they're going to get charged for it. It's funny how quickly the calls stop coming in. Um, maintenance issues, uh, you know, it's an important point. HMOs take a hell of a lot more abuse than a single let property ever will. Uh, you know, people don't care as much about things like showers getting blocked. We've had tenants that are showering in three inches of water um, because the drain's blocked. They've not told anyone. They've not tried to unblock it. And then they're surprised when it starts pouring over the side and floods the bedrooms underneath it. They're just not as vocal about things like that. It's always someone else will fix it. Someone else will report it. Someone else will take care of it. Um, so yeah, you've, you've you've got to be on the ball. Get your ten, your, your cleaners to do inspections. Try to nominate a lead tenant to report issues to you and do things like take the bins out, um, or just get in there yourself if you're local every couple of weeks and make sure that. You know, fire doors are still closing properly, door handles are working, light bulbs don't need replaced, showers aren't blocked, all that sort of stuff. It is, you know, there's, I always say there's a reason the HMOs are so profitable and that's because they're, you know, they're, they're a lot more work than, than single lets. People think that it's a passive income and it's, it's absolutely not. But if you can get the teams and the systems in place like Nick has got, then, you know, it, it can be a great income uh, and we love them, but don't be fooled they are more work than most other investment strategies and that is why the income is higher I mean, just, just a quick system tip for you guys i mean systemization tip is uh get a, get, a, get a spreadsheet laminate it so it can be drawn on and then wipe down uh give it to the cleaner and it can just be property address time date whatever and you can have a check off list so it can just be check fire escape is clear check that um Check that the bins have been put out and empty. Check that there's no leaks under the sinks because sometimes you get a little leak under the kitchen sink and it builds up into you know over a period of months it rots rot all the back out and you know it's a lot of money to replace. So you know check under the sinks and check the taps are working okay and they're not they're not loose and wobbly and these are all just quick little things that the cleaning can go around and check for you. Checking security, people aren't leaving windows open, people aren't leaving lights on, for example. Uh, general hygiene and cleanliness. All of these things you can get your cleaner to do. She's not she, but he or she could be the eyes and ears on the ground for you in your property. That's somebody that's there on a regular basis that's looking at it for you. Uh, and then you can go and do quarterly inspections yourself where you check all the bedrooms as well. Yeah. Because we offer the laundry service. Some of our tenants who use that, we actually get to look in their rooms as well. So, or also because we use the same handyman for all the works. He's around a lot of the properties. Like Mike said, you get a lot of maintenance with HMOs. So we've always got somebody in our HMOs, either the handyman or the cleaner. So we're always getting things reported back to us. So it's a good way to um, it's a good way to keep tabs on things. Cool. Right, I want to get someone else on the phone. Um, so if anyone else does want to have a chat with us, feel free to post your number. I don't know how Victoria is doing it. I think you're maybe emailing your number to her. Um, but yeah, it'd be cool to get someone else on the phone if you've got. A deal that you're maybe looking at or you've got some a project in flight that you're having problems with whatever it might be happy to have a chat about that in the meantime uh, Danny asked a question Nick I think you've already typed a response to this about average tenant stays um, you said about nine months that tends to be what we see as well obviously it can vary sometimes we get a tenant after two months saying either my jobs changed my circumstances have changed I need to change location or just living in a shared house isn't what I thought it would be uh, and to move out and you know if we can accommodate that we typically say within a tenancy, 
if we can find someone else to replace you, then we'll release you from your tenancy at that point. Um, so it might take us a few weeks, but they can normally get out within that six month period if they want to. You don't need to do that. You're not obliged to. But from a goodwill point of view, if you can find another tenant, then I don't see any issue with that. Um, you, you might even want to charge them the, you know, the fees for replacing that tenant, whether it's 100 quid or 150 quid, you know, marketing admin costs. You can say to the tenant, if you want to leave early, you're going to have to pay that as well. Up to you. Um, average tenancies are about nine months and then you get some people that will stay in them for years quite happily. Um, but yeah, yeah, totally varies. But yeah, nine months is, is the average. Is that, is that what you said as well, Nick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, well, I think six and 12 months, so the average is nine, yeah. Okay. Um, Carl's asked about the cost of... Nick's answered again on the chat. He keeps answering on the chat and stealing my thunder. Nick's stealing my thunder. Nick, what are you doing answering in the chat? I didn't realize it was working this way. Yeah, come on. <laughs> We're only an hour and 23 minutes into it. Get with the program. Right. So Carl's asked about the cost, the running cost of an HMO. Um, I mean, the main categories, uh, again, we can share it. Nick and I have both got deal analysis spreadsheets available on websites and wherever else um, that have got a breakdown of the typical running costs. But I mean, what are your thoughts? Any Anything that's changed, any any kind of non-standard ones that people get caught out with or anything you want to add on running costs? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people get caught out on the gas, um, you know, on the heating side of it because they don't put any smart thermostats in. They just have like a normal thermostat and the tenants have all the windows open and the heating on full blast. So, uh, you know, that, that makes the gas bill go crazy. But if you if you put a smart a smart thermostat in, such as uh, Heat Genius is what I'm using now, it's really, really good, or Inspire Heating Solutions or anything like that, it's basically got to have a lockable system on it so you can lock it, stop the tenants from um, turning it up, really. You've probably um, used all, you've probably tried all of them at some point, right? You've tried Nest and Hive and Inspire and... Yeah. What, what's, what's the reason behind the... What, what, what did you say you're using now? Home Genie? Heat genius, Heat genius. Is the reason now, which is the best. Um, yeah, yeah, it's about three hundred fifty pounds, including VAT, to to supply and fit. Um, and it's a really good system, and you can sign it, and you can have uh, an individual thermostat on every radiator. You can have sensors in all the rooms. It senses when someone walks in, turns the heating on. It senses if they open the window and it turns the heating off. Um, it senses if there's a foreign heating object, such as a uh, uh, electric heater. Mm -hmm. So keep tabs on electrical usage as well through it um so yeah heat genius is the one to use but i mean if you wanted to do a full big hmo of all the sensors you're talking a couple grand um but if you were just doing a small four bed then yeah you know you could bang one in downstairs one upstairs spend 700 pounds or something and it worked pretty well um but that, that's the big thing i mean council tax doesn't really change hopefully uh heat and electricity you can kind of control water is pretty much fixed unless you're on a meter in which case it can vary Broadband, you know, internet, TV license is all in insurance, are all pretty steady numbers, really. Mm -hmm. So the only variables I would say is um, is your heating and your electricity. Um, and obviously, you need to take into account things like if you do pack testing, fire regulations. Um, if you've got grade A fire alarm systems and big HMOs, you've got to get that tested every, what is it, six months or so. Um, so that costs money as well. Every, every 12 months, typically, for a fire alarm. You, you, it should be tested every week and serviced every year, in theory. Yeah, I mean, the whole test in it every week's a bit questionable because I spoke to um, a few people about that and they said you're supposed to be trained on it. Yeah. And I said, well, what level? And he said, well, show how to test it. And I went, so my cleaner could do it then. He went, oh, I don't know about that. I went, well, why not? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a competent individual. It's a cleaner. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, well, I don't know, but stand up in court. So it's a little bit questionable, some of it. But, um, yeah, you know, so you got it's just like, you got to take into account not just your monthly outgoings, but you need to take into account annual outgoings. Mm -hmm. If you've got HMO licenses, anything like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, cleaner. Obviously, if you've got a cleaner, that costs money. Yeah. Um, Even just yeah, things like gas safety that. bills and all that sort of stuff. Like you say, it's a lot of people just look at the monthly costs, and then there's probably you know, five hundred quid a year maybe in miscellaneous service charges and uh, you know gas safety certs and all that sort of stuff that you can add on top as well um yeah what about what do you charge for property management do you have a, a kind of fixed percent or that sort of average that you charge your landlords for hmo management yeah i mean we're charging uh 12 percent of VAT at the minute okay uh, seems pretty reasonable 
could pay anything yeah, from sort of 10 or 12 up to 20 i've seen people charging so it can vary a lot but yeah i guess for that one it's just a case of phoning a few agents and seeing what they charge and if they say what's an hmo it's probably worth looking for someone else yep <laughs> well what's spare room .com? that's one other yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah what about letting agents obviously i guess you advocate using letting agents but i mean are there any under what circumstances do you think people can get away with self-managing? Um, yeah, I mean, somebody put a question about this earlier, I think, I was going to think about that, actually. You can systemize, really, really heavily systemize yourself. And, you know, I managed my portfolio whilst I was away with the Navy. So, you know, but I had to have somebody on the ground at all times. Whether that's the cleaner or the handyman or a friend or someone like that, Need somebody who can do the viewings for you when you get an empty room. You need somebody that can deal with lockouts. You know, you can you can systemize lockouts. I mean, you can put the code on the front door to get the keys so they can get in, and you could put one of those on each bedroom as well if you wanted to. So you could have a lockbox code on every single bedroom, um, or you could change all the locks out and just get get the numbered ones where you're pressing the code and then you're in sort of thing. So there is a way of getting around lockouts, repairs, reporting repairs. You know, a tenant can report to your local individual who can report it to your handyman. Or your handyman can be your local individual and they do the viewings for you too mm -hmm. for a couple extra quid. There is ways you can do it. There is ways you can re remotely manage. It's just that it's hard as well. It's quite hard. You don't really know what's going on at the property sometimes and it's a bit, it can be difficult. You can, it can stress you out a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't get the rents in one month, you start panicking, like what the hell's gone on? And you start talking to the tenants and you find out all sorts of stuff's happened that you weren't aware of. And, uh, HMO is not particularly passive, I wouldn't say, unless you get someone local, local letting agency to manage it for you. And, it, and if they're good, it can be quite a passive, uh, you know, investment strategy. But um, in, generally speaking, HMO is not super passive. I yeah. say. I mean, I've <laughs> got a, a, a degree. It's not passive at all. A couple of thoughts on that. I think the first difficulty can be finding a good local letting agent who actually understands HMO management. It's completely different to single lets, and some people will. Like I say, say what the hell's an HMO? Other people will say, yeah, sure, I can do that with no actual knowledge of them. Um, you need an HMO specialist letting agent to take care of your property if you're going to go down the agency route. We self-manage our portfolio. Obviously, I ran a letting agency um, a couple of years back, so I've got the experience there. I think the most important thing, or the biggest difficulty maybe, is understanding all the legislation and all the changes um, but you can you can learn all of that. There are resources out there where you can learn and understand. And if you're happy to keep on top of that side of things, then it's definitely not impossible to do it yourself. What you got to think about though is the kind of the end game. Are you doing this to replace an income and you're happy to have another job? In which case, managing your own portfolio can be fine. Even when you get up to a couple of properties, it can be quite a burden and things like holidays can be difficult if all the tenants have got your mobile number and you go away, there's an issue, who's going to deal with it for you? Um, so it's, it's kind of having that conversation with yourself. Do you want to be a landlord or an investor? If you're happy to be hands-on and have it as a job, you work for your income, that's absolutely fine. If you want to spend more of your time whining and dining investors looking for your next deal on site with your builders project managing your your development projects then at some point you're going to have to outsource the management of your hmos to someone else you could look at a letting agency like pegasus or equally you could look at employing someone um you know you don't need to use a letting agency but you don't need to do it yourself you could take on a member of staff or find someone on a kind of you know, freelance or self-employed basis to do it for you, then you've got to train them up. So again, it comes back to you having the knowledge, but um, that's what we're looking to do. Don't really have a huge amount of faith in any of the HMO letting agents around here. So we've got a goal when we get to a certain level, we will have a member of staff and as well as looking after the HMO portfolio, she'll probably start doing some, or he, I, I don't know why I keep reverting to she as well, Nick, you've got me in that frame of mind. Um, but yeah, he or she will also be responsible for, you know, checking the emails and doing a bit of kind of admin stuff for us as well. So with the, the business that we've got going on, we're factoring in that cost at some point down the line, and we're just going to have to deduct that from our profit. So there's a couple of different options, but you got to think about how much time can you commit to it now? How much time do you want to commit to it in the future? And how much faith do you have in yourself and the people that are in your local area? Who's going to do the best job of it for you? It's a big investment at the end of the day. You want to make sure it's managed in the right way. Um, so yeah, you've, you've got to have faith in whoever you're, you're entrusting that to. 
Um, question from Thomas on the HMO market in Europe. Now, I'm going to put my hands up. I'm, I'm, I'm again kind of channeling Gary V here. I don't know anything about the HMO market in Europe, so I'm not going to try and bullshit you. Um, it's, it's not something I've ever explored. I don't know what the legislation's like. I don't know what the demand is like. Um, Nick, I mean, have you got any experience? Have you got any investors out there? No. Like the UK. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Thomas. Like I say, I, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to talk for the sake of talking. Um, I don't want to tell you something that's not true. I imagine there's going to be demand for it. Um, you know, everyone kind of in the Western world lives in similar sorts of ways. We all go through university, living with other people, so there might be demand for it. But you know, it could just be the legislation's not in place for it, or a whole host of reasons why it may or may not work. But unfortunately, I've got no idea. So yeah, apologies, I can't answer that one. Have we got any more questions? Um, yes, uh, question from Amar. Is doing major structural additions and changes the only way to get a commercial valuation when we finance them? Okay, I think this is gonna be the last question, then we'll wrap it up. But um, on commercial valuations as a topic generally, Nick, be interested to get your thought. But Amar has asked specifically, is doing major structural work and development work to a property the only way to get a commercial valuation on something? No, um, it's it's basically when the guy when when the person does the valuation, they're looking at it and they're thinking, is this a HMO? That's that's question number one. Is it a HMO? If it's had a change of use from C three dwelling into sui genesis or whatever, uh, you know, planning category says it is a HMO. If it's got a license on it, it says it is a HMO as well. However, if it's just a house that looks like the house next door and you've put a couple on suites in there and now you've got a license on it as a result, does that mean it's going to get commercially valued? Probably not. It's a bit of a grey area. I've heard of people who can get commercial valuations on five bedroom HMOs, licensed HMOs. I've never heard of anyone getting a commercial valuation on an unlicensed HMO because an unlicensed HMO is basically just a normal house with fire doors on or whatever. So, um, you know, it's, it's got to be, it's, it's normally what they say is it's got to be um, a, a proper renovation into a HMO, you know, structural works, en suites. It's got to be, it's got to be done in such a way that it can't easily be converted back into a family home again. So if you've got en suites and all the rooms and all the services and all the electrics wired up and to convert that back into a family house again, would actually cost thousands of pounds. It's, 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 would normally then get valued as a HMO, but it's a really, um, it's a really tricky question. I get asked it quite frequently, and that's kind of my answer: is um, you know, if it's change of use and it's got all on suites in and it's licensed, it's definitely a HMO. If it looks like the house next door, and all you've done is is sort of renovate it and stick some fire doors on, and it's unlicensed, even if it is licensed, you're probably not going to get a commercial valuation either. Yeah. You're going to get a bricks and mortar valuation. Having said that. Kent Reliance do a hybrid valuation, which I've had done on one of my HMOs. So it was effectively like a buy to let mortgage with a kind of buy to let rate, but they valued it taking the rental income and the, and the bricks and mortar value into consideration, which means it was valued a lot higher than the bricks and mortar value would have been, but still not, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten times gross rental income multiplier. But it was still worth a lot more than what I paid for it anyway. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my answer. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd, I'd go along with that. I think, I mean, for me, I'd be even kind of less optimistic on the chances of getting a commercial valuation these days. Some lenders who were quite eager to get into the HMO market, you know, a couple of years ago are less keen now. Um, commercial, you know, commercial to residential conversions, big HMOs that need planning permission, need licensing yeah, you will probably be able to get a commercial valuation on them, but anything that looks like a house, uh, you know, I would I would assume that you're gonna get a bricks and mortar valuation on it. And then if you get a commercial valuation, happy days. Um, but you know, just because you've gone into the loft and added a couple of extra bedrooms or done a small extension at the back or added a few en suites, doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna look at it any differently to the house next door. We've even seen a couple of cases where houses that have been converted into HMOs to the extent that they would be very costly to convert back to a single family home have been downvalued because the surveyor has been in a bit of a bad mood and said, well, you know, it's gonna cost 20 grand to turn this back into a family home, so I'm gonna knock 20 grand off the price of it. 
could happen. So just keep that in mind. But I mean, that's very rare. I'd assume if it looks like a house, you're going to get a bricks and mortar valuation. Anything else is a bonus. If it's a commercial to resi conversion, if it's, you know, potentially a new build, then yeah, you, you should be able to get a commercial conversion on it. But like I said to Andrew back at the start, you know, before any project, speak to a broker, run it past them and see what their thoughts are on it. And then you can kind of hold them accountable to, to work extra hard to make sure that they get you the deal that they've said you're going to be able to get. Um, there's quite a few questions, like like quite specific questions. The chat of this will become the comment, I believe will become the comments of this video. If not, we'll get a transcript of it anyway. So all of the, the questions that are specific that we've not had a chance to answer yet, Nick and I will try to get to them, whether it's tonight or over the course of the next couple of days. Um, my email address is mike at insidepropertyinvesting.com. Nick, yours is nick at pegasuspg.com. Yeah. Okay. So um, if anyone does want to contact us about anything HMO related, feel free or, you know, Facebook, social media is a good place to get us as well. Um, top right somewhere around about here. I don't know. I have no idea. There should be a little I if you want to subscribe to Nick's YouTube channel down here. Maybe there's a little IPI logo if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and what else have I got to say? Anything else for you, Nick, to wrap up? I've quite enjoyed it. I like the calls. I want more calls next time. That was good. But yeah, no, I've, I've had a really good time. It's been nice um, answering all these questions. And uh, yeah, this has been a bit of a different format for webinar. I think it's worked quite well despite the uh, technology issues. That yeah, I know. I'd, 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 love, I'd love your feedback. I don't know if there's a little thumbs up button at the bottom of the video as well. I've got 12 thumbs up and two thumbs down. Two thumbs down. Who was that Rob guy? One was Rob. I don't like Rob. Rob's not invited ones. back to the next one. Nick and I will do this again at some point in the future, I'm sure. But yeah, if you could give us a thumbs up underneath as well before you disappear. This will be recorded and sent out. I'll cut out all the bit in the middle where we lost contact so nobody else will know except from you that the technology side of things didn't work perfectly. Um, and yeah, any other questions, feel free to keep sticking them in the, the chat or in the comments of this video once it's uploaded uh, and we'll, we'll get back to as many of them as we can. But I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, we'll wrap up there. Let you get back to this nice sunny evening. All right. Cheers, bye. Cool. Thank you, Nick. And uh, yeah, we'll speak soon, I'm sure. Bye, guys.